So good morning, everybody, and welcome to our first, the first webinar that we've hosted, or that I've hosted for the S Company. Um, and we're really thrilled that you're able to join us. For those that weren't able to um, join us at live today, we will be recording it, and we will make sure that we make that available via various channels, but also to anybody that's registered. Uh, so my name is Lavinia Winch. I am an ambassador for the S yes Company. I've worked for the company for 10 years, and I have to admit that I have a personal interest in this particular topic. Uh, actually, I'm passionate about all women's health, but I uh, had a total hysterectomy after an endometrial cancer diagnosis in 2015. Um, and so um, I, I thought it would be a really brilliant thing to um, ask Leila if she would um, talk to us about um, the, the challenges that people may have after hysterectomy in terms of their sexual function. Um, so we're really thrilled and really very grateful for Leila to be joining us today. And I'm going to give you a little bit of background um, to her. So Dr. Leila Fodgson is a consultant gynecologist. She's a specialist in psychosexual medicine and menopause, and she graduated from medical, medical school in 1995 and has worked in women's health since, and that's over 10 years of consultant level. Her special interests are in sexual pain disorders, sexual difficulties after cancer and fertility treatment, menopause, managing gynecological conditions with non-surgical techniques, and tocophobia, which I recently learned is a morbid fear of childbirth. She is passionate about improving women's healthcare and works in both undergraduate and postgraduate medical education. And what I would love to say is that I have been honored to be at quite a few of Leila's lectures, both at the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecology and at the Institute of Psychosexual Medicine. And every time I listen to her speak, I am moved by her empathy, apart from her amazing medical experience and background, there's a sort of a real understanding about the issues that, um, that, women, that some of us women face, uh, particularly in terms of our sexual health and sexual function. Um, Eleanor Gardner uh, has a master's degree in physiotherapy and is the founder and owner of Pelvic Relief, where she has brought together quality products and information to manage conditions such as pelvic pain, and pain for sex. Pelvic Relief are UK distributors of sole source dilators and ONUT, which is an intimate wearable device allowing couples to explore comfortable penetration depths. And we'll talk about that more because I know Leila's going to feature that. Um, so we're not actually doing a question and answer um, session in this uh, because it could take us right the way through to an hour. And I think we're, we're going to try and cover everything. If you do have any particular questions that you want to ask afterwards, then please do email me. You would have had my email details when you registered for the webinar, and we'll see if we can point you in the right direction. I think the chat um, function is going to be working, and I think Elle is very kindly going to keep an eye on that for us. So um, over to you, Leila. I'd love you to give us an overview of, of, of how this talk's going to go. So I thought what we would do is go through a little bit why we might do hysterectomy um, and then um, recovery from hysterectomy, the types of hysterectomy and how we can help to get sex back on track after hysterectomy. So I'm just going to make this a little bit smaller so that I don't get disturbed by my face as I'm talking. I hate doing that even after a whole year on Zoom. So seeing, um, seeing yourself at the same yeah, time. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I do it all the time, but I still don't like it very much. So um, you can see that I'm passionate about sex because I've got naked women behind me in my study at home, which my parents, my kids joke that I'm like the sex education uh, mum on that lovely series. And they're probably the boy who goes and gives advice in school uh, because people ask them when they know what I do. So I started training in gynecology in 96. I started training with the Institute of Psychosexual Medicine in 99, just before I got married, actually. No coincidence there. It was purely that I had a patient who told me that she hadn't had sex through her whole marriage and it was her 50th wedding anniversary. And could I please fix her when I was a very junior registrar? And I thought, wow, 
wow, I'm so privileged that this woman has told me something that has been just devastating for her whole life. And she's never managed to tell anyone else. So I was privileged. Um, and yet she left me with something that was so enormous and that I felt I couldn't manage. So I started training in psychosexual medicine. And then I guess the rest is history, really. I've been the chair of the training organization. I continue to train um, allied health professionals and doctors in managing sexual problems in women and men, um, because sexual problems do not happen in isolation. Uh, I know there's a lot of talk, if you look on social media, about men having that magic tablet, and so they don't need as much care, they're not as complicated. I can honestly tell you they're just as complicated and one of the reasons you may struggle with getting sex back after hysterectomy is because your partner feels very anxious about hurting you or about what indeed is there after hysterectomy. So why might you need a hysterectomy? Apologies for the mm, slightly gruesome picture down on the bottom uh, there on the right. Uh, this is a woman who has blogged about recovery from hysterectomy. And I think that's a really important thing that we realize actually what to expect because otherwise that bruising around your scar may be a source of great anxiety to you. Um, so I'm not giving you loads of gruesome pictures, that's probably the most gruesome picture, um, but I am gonna give you a really realistic idea about the scarring that you expect from hysterectomy. So I'm gonna touch on alternatives to hysterectomy because it may be that some of you are healthcare professionals who are working with women with gynae problems uh, where they're really struggling to find a solution um, and that uh, we should realize that hysterectomy is not the be all and end all. When I started in gynae 25 years ago, we used to have hysterectomy or two on every single operating list. And that's how I built my surgical skills. <laughs> but those days are gone. Um, and now we very rarely do hysterectomies. Mm. And in fact, they have to go to specialist surgeons because we do so few now that not all consultant gynecologists will be doing them. And one needs to keep your hand in on technical procedures like this. So then we'll talk a little bit about reintroducing sex. So why do we perform hysterectomy? There are benign conditions. I would really hesitate to describe endometriosis and adenomyosis as benign uh, in the layperson's definition, because they are incredibly difficult conditions to live with. And many women will be advised to have a hysterectomy um, because of uh, endometriosis. Um, when it really is at their wits end with their pain. Will it make them better? That's a moot point, actually. Uh, we know that removing ovaries can make you better because you've no longer got the hormones that are driving endometriosis. But we don't fully know if hysterectomy makes you better, depending on what is going on with your endo. We may also be looking at end, um, heavy bleeding or fibroids. There are lots of solutions now for heavy bleeding or fibroids that mean that hysterectomy may not be necessary. Um, so the other thing um, we do is, uh, sorry, I've missed a slide here, have I? No? Okay. So what alternatives to hysterectomy and benign disease um, that we can use hormones? It might be that you think about having a progestogenic intrauterine system. A lot of people call these coils. They are, they are the antithesis of coils. Coils cause pain and heavy bleeding. Mirena, Kalena, the progestogenic systems, reduce yeah. bleeding and reduce pain. And I have to say on occasion, we don't get a clear diagnosis. We might do a laparoscopy that's normal. It may be that there's endometriosis under the surface of the um, peritoneum, the lining of the pelvis. And we may use a Mirena in the hope that it will sort print the symptoms. And it will do in many women. They're not for everyone, but they can help. The next move from there is a laparoscopy where we might burn away endometriosis. You can see there on the right, there's a picture of inside someone's tummy, ovary top right in that picture, with an area of endometriosis that possibly to you doesn't look particularly dramatic. I'm really sorry, my husband unplugged my laptop. I'm gonna to have to unplug it in. The joys of working from home, apologies. Um, so, <laughs> So the other thing we can do is if someone has heavy bleeding, we could do hysteroscopy. There's a picture of that there in the middle, um, which is where we put a very fine camera into uh, the womb through the cervix. Um, outpatient hysteroscopy gets a really bad press, and I know there are some women who find this catastrophically painful. I can tell you I've been doing outpatient hysteroscopy for uh, 14 years. I do not have women in pain. 
I do not tolerate women being in pain. I give them plenty of analgesia first. If that procedure is painful, unless they say, I want to continue, I will stop. And that's the way good outpatient hysteroscopies should work. Um, it may be that you have that done in the operating theatre. We can remove fibroids, a bit like peeling a potato. Uh, we take layers of the fibroid off so we don't take it off all in one go uh, through the hysteroscope. And we can also do endometrial ablation. If you look down bottom right there, that little gold triangle that's in the wound, uh, actually we used to joke, they are made of gold. Uh, and my theatre nurses used to say, we could make some jewellery out of these, we shouldn't bin them. Um, and they, what they do is they burn away the lining of the womb, which can be a really fantastic solution for women in their forties if they don't get on with the morena, calena, um, and perhaps removal of the fibroid doesn't sort things out for them. So why do we perform hysterectomy if we're worried about something being suspicious, maybe something turning into cancer, maybe something being cancer, like Lavinia's just alluded to? So it may be that there is an endometrial cancer, which is lining of the womb cancer, which is down on the bottom right. It may be that we see a cervical cancer, the stages of cervical cancer are there. The majority, thank goodness, of, in women who are having regular smears will be the very early stages and may just be cured by removing a cone of tissue from the cervix, so hysterectomy is not necessary. But some, if you look at that later picture, with the redness around it, maybe that it's gone into the pelvis and we have to do a Wertheim's hysterectomy, which is where we remove a lot more of the pelvic tissue. Um, so the other one is ovarian cancer. It may be that you have a scan, you've got some pain, uh, we see a big cyst. We have um, a pro forma that tells us whether or not we should consider hysterectomy. The feeling is that if we're going in and we're taking that tube and ovary, if your fertile period in your life is over and you're happier to have one stage of surgery, we may say, well, actually, let's just make sure that we've covered everything. And it may be that the results come back from the lab saying this was just suspicious, it wasn't cancer, but then it's, it can be reassuring for women. I think what's really important with all hysterectomies is that we have a really open conversation with women about why we're thinking of doing hysterectomy, what the other options are, um, and what the benefits versus risks are. So types of hysterectomy, you can have a total hysterectomy, which includes the cervix. So if you look at that picture there on the right, uh, total hysterectomy will be where we cut off around the cervix, taking maybe a little bit of vagina. Um, if we're looking at cancers of the cervix or of the endometrium, it may be that we remove a vaginal cuff which means taking one or two centimeters or even more of the vaginal tissue. If that were to happen, the best way to manage that post-operatively is when things have healed well, is to use uh, vaginal dilators and those with a broad tip on them so that we make sure that we rebuild the top end of the vagina so it's anatomically easier for sex. Um, the subtotal uh, hysterectomy is where we leave the cervix. Uh, there was a lot of debate about risks versus benefits. Every woman has a different experience. Somebody did do a piece of research looking at subtotal versus total with a sexuality questionnaire. I'm not sure that sexuality questionnaires give us all the answers, but they showed there was no difference between the two, um, the two types of hysterectomy for women in terms of sort of the broader sense of sexuality. But I think what's really important is that we listen to our patients. If you have a completely normal cervix and you're happy to continue to have smears and you'd rather it was left, there's no reason why you can't have that done. But that's something to ask your gynecologist if you feel strongly about that. Many hysterectomies now are done laparoscopically rather than through the tummy. So that really big scar that we saw in that first picture ten is tending to be a thing of the past. Apart from if we've got cancer surgery and we think that we're going to need to take extra tissue from the surrounding area, we may need better access, although even in cancer cases now, it's largely um, laparoscopic. So if you look at the pictures of how we do vaginal hysterectomies, that is all done through the vagina. I'm sorry, this looks slightly gruesome. Uh, you're probably looking at that and thinking, gosh, those sorts of pictures look a bit like a penis. Well, when we do a vaginal hysterectomy, it can look a bit like that when the cervix comes through the vagina. And I've certainly had uh, medical students in theatre who come in only with consent of patients who've walked in and said, I think I'm in the wrong theatre. <laughs> it looks that way. Um, 
obviously it's not a funeral, um, but the cervix can look a little bit that way. Um, we do rarely do abdominal hysterectomies now. So if we look at the scars that you may have, uh, you may just have no scars because you've had a vaginal hysterectomy. In the middle picture there of that little um, cartoon, you may have a number of scars from having a laparoscopic, or you may have that one large one that we, we're kind gynecologists. I know perhaps we don't get that press, but we try and give you a scar that you can hide if you're wearing a bikini. Um, occasionally in the pubic hair line, although not many people have pubic hair these days. So your average scar will look like top right up there. My goodness, how I'd love to have that tummy and that scar. Um, and then sometimes we can get worse scarring. There's a picture of a woman here who's blogged about her laparoscopic surgery, I think with some horror when she saw the bruising that she had. So don't expect that really neat little picture immediately after surgery. It's very normal to have some bruising and then it will tend to go down and the scars look less prominent. The exception to that is keloid scarring. That particularly affects some skin types, particularly heavily pigmented skin, and it may be that you get thickened scars. If you're somebody who's had that from ear piercings, then it's worth telling your surgeon that because there are things we can do to reduce keloid scarring. So what happens inside? Um, one thing I haven't covered is prolapse in terms of hysterectomy. And the reason I haven't is because actually prolapse is really an indication for hysterectomy these days. We have a urogynecologists who specialize in prolapse and bladder problems. They're subspecialists within gynecology who will often now do a vault suspension, be that with a laparoscopic sacrocolpoplexy or a sacrospinous fixation where we do a stitch into the, the um, sacral region, the bone at the back of your body to lift the vagina up. And often what we find is that by lifting the vagina up and supporting the womb, that we get a better cosmetic and anatomical result for sexual activity than we perhaps do if we stitch those over. However, there is still a place for prolapse where we stitch the front or the back of the vagina. And that's if there is a, a defect, a rip in the fascia. Um, I hesitate to talk this through as if you're preparing your Sunday joint, but when you're looking at a joint of meat, you'll see there's some quite tough tissue between planes of muscle, that's what supports the rectum and bladder inside the vagina. And if there's a tear there from childbirth generally, then that may be something we stitch over. So what happens inside, what's left, you can see on the left there, which is where we've got that picture of prolapse, there's a womb there with the ovary. And then when we've done the hysterectomy, you will have a vaginal canal that's a bit more like a sock. Um, it has an end to it that's been stitched over. If you were to gently put your fingers in the vagina when you, your um, wound is healed, you may find some slight ridging at the top end of the vagina. Um, it's quite difficult to feel that on yourself. You have to be fairly flexible, as I'm sure Elle will tell you in a minute as a physio. Um, but you will feel that there's no hole there. And I think that's really important for both you and your partner to know. I've certainly seen guys who've been terribly worried about what will happen when they penetrate during sex. So both of you may have great worries about how it feels. It may be that you feel that scarring on the tummy. It's not uncommon to get a little bit of what we call hyperesthesia, which is where we get in English, an increased sensation that can feel like a prickling or burning pain after you've done any sort of surgery. And that's just as those little um, nerves that we've cut, which are not visible to the naked eye, regenerate and grow. So you may go through a phase where you think, gosh, this is very sensitive and you struggle a bit to wear your lovely lace pants. So I'd suggest you get some big old granny knickers if you're having any sort of gynae surgery so that it's more comfortable. Um, but then you will find that maybe it will go numb for a bit and it can take 18 months. I had a caesarean section with my twins and actually it, did, it took me a good 18 months to feel normal sensation in my lower abdomen again after having a caesarean. And I don't think that's something that we talk about a lot. But it can certainly affect how you feel about sex. You know, you're a bit numb in an area that perhaps has felt quite erogenous to you before, or you've got pain there. And actually having missionary sex can be really uncomfortable. The other thing is, don't forget, if we remove your ovaries, you go from naught to 60 in seconds, rather than the gradual natural onset of menopause. So even if you are post-menopause or when you have hysterectomy, your ovaries are still producing some hormones, androgens, and possibly a little bit of estrogen. So you may just suddenly think, goodness, this feels like going back through the menopause again. 
and the vagina can be very sore. It feels like it no longer has stretch uh, mm. and it feels numb. People don't talk about it feel, feeling numb with menopause and that's really important. I have had women um, when I was a very junior doctor and I, you know, I didn't really know about this at that point. We, we don't talk about this very much in gynae. Who came and said, I've had a hysterectomy. They took my ovaries. I was prepared to feel the soreness, but what I wasn't prepared for is the fact that my clitoris has nearly disappeared and I can barely feel anything and I can't orgasm anymore. And this isn't okay. Now I know that I need to give that woman lots of estrogen um, and perhaps some prasterone, one of our new uh, tools in menopause care, which is DHEAS. Um, and it will act like estriol in the tissue. It will give you estrogen, but it also helps to build up muscles and increase sensitivity too. Top right, that slightly gruesome picture is a picture of the vault of the vagina after hysterectomy. Now what that little red thing is, is actually a fallopian tube that's dropped down. Um, that is very, very uncommon. That's the kind of thing that gets written about in medical press, which is why that's the only picture I could find on Google to show you what granulation tissue looks like. Those of you that have had babies may have noticed a little bit of redness and perhaps you've gone to see your doctor and they've done a little bit of treatment on that, just some silver nitrate. That can happen in the vagina. So you may find you start having sex again and maybe you decide to do that at about six weeks um, and you get bleeding and you think, my goodness, what's going on here? Um, but also it can cause pain too. So it's important that you get back to your gynecologist and get seen so that can be treated to make things more comfortable again. So what happens to sex? Mr. Bean, oh yes. And this couple here having a great sex life. The reason I put this slide up is that there are many, many women who find that hysterectomy is liberating. I'm not gonna say it's all bad, um, particularly women who've had catastrophic, perhaps constant bleeding um, related to perimenopause where they found that there's nothing suspicious going on and they are struggling to get out of the house. They can't wear light clothes. Um, but and particularly, they feel really inhibited about having sex in case they have very heavy bleeding during sex. So without that bleeding, and maybe without that pain, if your um, womb and ovaries are causing you a lot of pain, you suddenly found this new lease of life and sex is wonderful. That would be amazing if it happens to everyone. But even if sex is wonderful, you can have a journey to get sex back because an area of your body that has been there for pleasure has suddenly become something that you're feeling a bit trepidatious about. You've shown it to a lot of gynecologists, you've had it operated on, and you're not quite sure what to expect. Really, really great way to open a conversation about this and start communication is to watch the film Hope Springs, which is Meryl Streep and Tommy Lee Jones. Tommy Lee Jones in a character that I struggle to recognize him given what he's uh, acted in before. But this film, what this film does is it talks about sexual difficulties in a very lighthearted way. Of all my patients that I see, I recommend this to pretty much all of them because it's often about communication opening up again. And they're trepidatious about watching it because it's such an awkward area. But I've only ever had one in the last 10 years since I've been suggesting it, who's come back and said, oh my goodness, I, that upset me actually because I recognize myself in one of the characters. The vast majority will say that was such a lighthearted way to get that conversation going. I always watch it before you have the surgery so that you can think about where you're gonna go. Consider banning penetration. It's just so you get your confidence back up. So you start realizing, you know, you've been through big surgery. It can be difficult to get back on into a pattern of feeling that sex is there for pleasure again. Um, so if you just start building up slowly, think about some different sensations, use it as an opportunity to go and buy some exciting sex toys, some orgasm oils, just to see what feels new and good. Feel like it's your courting rather than your um, the end of your sex life. A really lovely couple that I saw. I often talk about scheduling. People look at me with horror. I can't possibly put that into um, my calendar. This is going to be absolutely terrible. Um, it's going to mean that it's something I'm dreading, it's going to be um, unnatural, it's going to be tense. They actually came back to me and said, we thought about this way to schedule, which was we put pieces of paper in a jar like sweets, and we've done enough for every single week. He put half in, I put half in, and we talked about things we love about sex. And actually what it meant they did is that they started seeing sex in a really positive line. 
and they introduce some new stuff that they've been a bit frightened to talk about before. Menopause. Menopause after surgical hysterectomy can be absolutely devastating, even if you're postmenopausal. Um, look at the green climacteric scale if you're in any doubt about whether or not your symptoms are menopausal. There are 34 symptoms on there of menopause. Most of us know about flushes, um, most of us know about difficulty with sleep, but a lot of the other issues we don't realise. Myself, I didn't particularly realise that I was menopausal and I got a morena in um, and started finding that my skin was really itchy and I got cracking of the skin on my feet. My sister, who's an architect, I was in New Zealand with her, said, do you think you're menopausal? She's a lot younger than me, I was pretty offended. But actually, do you know what? When I started on estrogel, all of those really weird symptoms that I was getting just went. So don't be frightened to talk about that. The exception to that is if you've had a hysterectomy for endometrial cancer. And if you have endometriosis and that's why you're having a hysterectomy, many consultants will suggest that you have a progestogen as well as uh, estrogen. So you should probably have a chat with a menopause specialist rather than just your gynecologist. So really important to know that you can get atrophy of the vulva. It may be that you're dealing with all those other symptoms, but you start seeing the light and then you decide to have sex and suddenly what used to be fantastic is sore and dry. You don't feel particularly like having it and it's difficult to orgasm, but that can all be cured. So estrogen will cure your symptoms. I put there again, we shouldn't be giving those out in endometrial cancers because that can cause them to regrow. We can use topical vaginal estrogens. Uh, I've got some examples there, Avestin and Vagifem. The new kid on the block is Vagirux, which is effectively the same as Vagifem, but with a lot less plastic. I like to reduce plastic. Um, I don't like to see how much we're throwing away uh, each month. So up to you, whatever your GP prescribes, but it costs exactly the same as Vagifem. So I'd suggest that Vagifem should probably reduce their plastic so that we can have both as an option. You may well find that having either of those in the vagina really helps with the discomfort of when the penis goes in, but what it might not do is increase sensitivity again. So I tend to also use something like a vesting cream on the vulva or prasterone uh, to increase sensitivity of the vulva. Um, you may not want to have um, topical systemic estrogens, the transdermal estrogens, which are um, the body identical ones like Estrogel or newer is Lenzetto, which is a spray that dries very, very quickly, as opposed to quite a long time for Estrogel to dry. I think my longest with Estrogel was 15 minutes. Lenzetto's done and dusted within two minutes, you can put your clothes on. If you still have a womb, then you will need to take Eutrogestan um, or another progestogen. Eutrogestan is risk neutral to breast. So effectively uh, the risks of HRT are far outweighed by the benefits now. It may be that you want to think about other options. If you have had a hysterectomy for endometrial cancers, you should talk to your oncologist about alternatives to HRT, but many are supportive of phytoestrogens, isoflavines that you can get in various foods. Lubricants, um, yes, oil-based uh, is my favorite. Uh, I use it an awful lot for women to do massage. Um, I tend to favor it over Yes VM. Uh, I know Lavinia um, talks very positively about water-based. It is something that I like my patients to use over the OB as the double glide, um, but I don't tend to find it's as good for massage because it absorbs quite quickly. Um, I'm not mad keen on silicon-based lubricants. I've put Durex Play there because it happens to come up as a picture on Google. Um, they, they can be associated with BV and discomfort. Um, so you're better off using something that's uh, silicon free, but something with menthol can sometimes help with discomfort. I'm a big fan of using oils, largely because a lot of my patients feel a bit worried about young children, teenagers finding their lubricants. Um, and also because some of them simply can't afford some of the, um, the marketed um, lubricants. So uh, a lot of my particularly menopausal women use organic uh, coconut oil to um, massage the perineum. Not advisable to use the one that you're using cooking spoons in. Keep a separate pot in the bathroom just for you to use there. Um, 
I've put rear entry up. I discovered rear entry because one of my patients who had catastrophic vulvodynia, pain in the vulva, found it was the only thing that helped with her discomfort and she managed to regain her sex life. Uh, there are lots of um, desensitizing lubes around. Uh, so just look at what's there and what suits you best. Uh, there's this huge market now in um, desensitizing lubes. Depth minimizers, I never met Elle before today, but I found out about ONUT. I use that a lot in my women who've had shortening of the vagina, some women who have um, menopausal uh, vulvo vaginal atrophy, but don't want to use um, east topical vaginal estrogens. There is pretty much no contraindication to topical, topical vaginal estrogens. It's only one milligram is absorbed systemically per year. Um, and if your oncologist says no, um, I would tend to write to them and say, this is how it's absorbed. Um, invariably with improvement in quality of life, they will say that's okay. But ONUT can be really amazing in endometriosis. I use it a lot for endometriosis sufferers. We were just chatting, some of you may have heard um, before you came in about how sometimes men can have difficulty with erection because they're really anxious about causing their partner's discomfort. And these can actually help a little bit with reducing erection issues because they um, act as a sort of uh, pressure at the base of the penis. The other thing you can buy is this very attractive pillow. Uh, it looks like something you might take uh, camping with your grandmother, um, but actually it's there. <laughs> Maybe your grandmother wouldn't know what it was, but it's there to enable you to be slightly more in control with depth. Um, so other helpful items, my goodness, uh, sex toys have really come on uh, leaps and bounds in the last few years. People are actually, they've gone mainstream. People are thinking about them as a sort of uh, technical project rather than something that's very much under the counter. Uh, they're rather things of beauty now. Look at that lovely one in the middle that looks like a pebble. Um, you can simulate oral sex very well with some of the sex toys. This one uh, over on the left actually uses some suction, air blowing on the clitoris. So explore, try things out. The other thing I try and do is with women where libido is lower, maybe after hysterectomy, maybe after many years of gynae issues, is really just get sex back on the page. Top right there is Dipsy, which is erotic mindfulness. It's not for everyone. There are lots of other versions coming out now. This was the first. I've got a few patients who like uh, Furley, that's specifically designed for women with sexual problems. My, my male patients listen to these two. It's a means of getting them in a more relaxed space because often anxiety is what's destroying sex. Um, Nancy Friday, she wrote a series of books on women's sexual fantasies. <laughs> she probably didn't put them out there thinking they'd be great for people with sexual problems, but they are amazing. So don't read all the blurb uh, between the sexual fantasies, just read the sexual fantasies, often very short. What they do is they allow your libido to rise, but they also give you something to put in your head as a fantasy if you're feeling anxious and you're losing the moment when it comes to feeling pleasure. Um, and then finally, Zestra, and I'm delighted that Yes are bringing out Yes Oh Yes, which I think is equally uh, good for Zestra. Um, they gave me some samples, I sent them to friends and they're all looking really delighted. Um, Zestra has been clinically proven in trials to reduce time to orgasm in women. I don't just use it in women, I use it in men too. And I'm excited that we might be able to make the yes, oh yes available to men too. Thank you very much for listening. Um, and you know, I, I hope that all of you, if you are going for hysterectomy or you're looking after people with hysterectomy, um, are able to guide people back to having a great sex life again after gynae procedure. Thank you. Okay, that was wonderful, Leila. Thanks so much. If you're able, oh, there we are. Great. Wow, that was just fantastic. Brilliant. So much covered. And I think it was really great that you mentioned the positive sides as well, because it is quite daunting. Um, if you haven't, uh, if, if a healthcare professional that you're, you're under hasn't talked about some of these issues and you, and you discover uh, afterwards that, you know, particularly if you're premenopausal, or even as you say, if you're postmenopausal, but some of these symptoms are going to come back once you lose your ovaries. So think about the positives as well. And I know that, um, you know, I've certainly spoken to people who have found that it really has liberated them, particularly, as you say, the people that have had fibroids and endometriosis and that sort of thing, very heavy periods. It really has made a huge difference. So thanks for the, for the positive side as well. 
I think um, maybe one of the things I didn't focus on was uh, patients with cancer. And I know you've mentioned that already, uh, Lavinia. I'm currently doing a study looking at women uh, with gynae cancers in my NHS trust, who I won't mention, um, where we're actually looking to see how many women disclose spontaneously, because I doubt it's very many. Mm -hmm. uh, they're often seen for physical checkups. They're so anxious about going along. They have their physical checkup and then they're just relieved. And it takes a lot for them to feel in a safe place to open up. So we're using a very generic questionnaire, the NSOG2, which has now been validated, which is how important is sex for you? How much is it making you stressed? I don't want to go into the nitty gritty and know how many orgasms they have or if they don't, because I don't think women want to disclose that to a piece of paper. They just want to say it's important, it's not working, and then we can signpost them to, to care. But that's a big study we're starting at the moment. And I'm hoping that's going to change things for women with cancers. Fantastic. Well, in fact, I think the the there are gynae oncology nurses, as you all know. So when so when I was first diagnosed, I was there and I saw the oncologist. There was a gynae oncology nurse. I had her card. I could call her whenever I want. So the there's a forum I think that supports these these particular nurses. And so I'm training them at the moment, actually, in my trust. Yeah. So we're doing a group of gynae oncology and the nurses there too and they feel they want a bit more confidence to open those conversations that's the thing isn't it and it's really about signposting isn't it they don't need to be an expert but they just need to acknowledge that there might be issues and help people understand where they can get the help and support so i think that's wonderful because that was going to be one of the questions i was going to ask what can we do to help healthcare professionals support them so that they can help their patients and that's across all types of hysterectomy, you know, it, it's, it would be fantastic. So it sounds like there is work going on there, which is great. So we are training, um, I don't know if Elle knows this actually, uh, we're training physios uh, in the Institute of Psychosexual Medicine. We train nurses and now they can do uh, our exams as well. That's been cleared recently. They were doing diploma in psychosexual medicine, they can now do membership. Um, so we're really passionate about making sure all healthcare professionals feel confident. One of my new group is a healthcare assistant who said, actually, what I find is they patients feel a little bit inhibited about talking to the consultant or the CNS because mm. they feel they're busy. Whereas I'm the person who kind of brings them a cup of tea if they're feeling anxious. Yeah. And then they go, you're really nice. Let me talk to you. And they, they just want to feel confident in how they talk about it. And I think that's something we hear quite a lot is when you're in that acute phase of treatment, um, certainly with some of the cancers and your your consultant has been dealing with that phase. It's then afterwards where that journey takes you next. And, um, you know, the signposting to there are psychosexual therapists, there are women's health physiotherapists who can actually help you progress from you know, that initial post-operative sort of getting well and getting your body well, and then dealing with the relationship or the sort of musculoskeletal side effects of what your body's gone through. Um, so yeah, sometimes it's just signposting, knowing there is a broader healthcare community out there to help you further along the journey, you know, after that um, initial phase. So Macmillan did a great piece of work. I'm not sure if you were involved in that, Lavinia, that was, uh, I think it was before I was chair of the IPM, so it's probably about 10 years ago, where they really focused on sex and being a survivor of cancer or going through treatment and keeping your sex life and how important it was for you as a couple to keep that emotional bond. And um, unfortunately, it seemed to fizzle out. Um, I was really hoping that we might then have a clear pathway for patients. Mm. Um, so I think it's our it's our duty as healthcare professionals who are seeing people in this position to raise it. How sex? It doesn't take much. Two words. How sex? <laughs> yeah, I think they have both. Um, I think Macmillan do do some some booklets. They 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 don't get updated very often. So you know they're like it takes about five years before it gets updated. And the question is, what is the right time? What is the right timing? When you know if you're given a leaflet, you're reading all about the surgery and everything initially. You possibly don't want to look that far ahead. You know you take one thing at a time, and then by the time you're actually recovering and thinking about sexual recovery, 
think the leaflets, the booklets probably been put away somewhere and you completely forgot that there was a whole section on sexual recovery and which lubricants are good and all that sort of stuff. So I think it, it, it's a question of, of it, be, it would be better if there were, and I, certainly the Women's Health Physios are a wonderful team of, of people to help with that. And actually, I'd just like to ask a little bit about, you mentioned prolapse in relation to, um, if, so a uterine prolapse, it, it, it's not necessarily always first line treatment to do a hysterectomy, but in terms of post hysterectomy, the prolapse, so a, um, a bladder prolapse or a little bit of rectal prolapse, it, is it your opinion, Leila, that if that, that, is, that is as a result of a pelvic floor not being very strong? You mentioned the fascia, you mentioned the fact that some, you know, there's A, there's well, a. Well, is the best person to describe <laughs> this because <laughs> prolapse is not my area. No. But you have your pelvic floor that's your third level support, but you've also got your ligaments that hold your womb in as well. So yeah. if we take a womb out, that's why it's going out of vogue to do a hysterectomy. We used to kind of go, well, maybe the womb is pulling the vagina down. But now we know, actually, you need that support of those cardinal ligaments, which we cut in hysterectomy to hold everything back up. So you're better off managing that problem. And often people, what, what they do now is they say, let's get your pelvic floor much better because that can really help. And that's certainly much better in terms of continence than operating, isn't it, Elle? Yeah, but it's yeah. also we might not actually even do that nip and tuck on the front and back wall if we've done a sacrospinous fixation lifted up the vagina um, because we may find that it's actually that resolves symptoms yeah and is that a separate operation or is that a procedure that is carried out at the same time Leila? so sometimes people do hysterectomy so say you've got very heavy bleeding that's resistant to other treatment you may do a hysterectomy and then do the support at the end or you may do it in someone who's already had a hysterectomy because we know that prolapse is more common after hysterectomy. So they may then years later have that, uh, that operation or they may do it without a hysterectomy. Okay, that's really, that's really helpful to know because I think that can come again as a little bit of a shock to that something's a change in terms of the structure that you haven't necessarily, you know, you've thought, well, I've had the surgery and then, then things start to change. So just to be aware of that. And they may, they may not bother the, the, the woman at all. They may, she may, may be asymptomatic, but there might be, yeah, I mean, presumably it can make, and make intercourse a little bit more uncomfortable if you have some prolapse. Well, do you know, so this is a really interesting point. <laughs> it isn't clear that it does. And Claudine Domini does an amazing talk talking about um, women who've come to see her with prosodentia, full prolapse, who actually have had a very, very good sex life. They've been sent along because the GP or the practice nurse has noticed it as smear. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily the case that you have difficulties with sex. I think quite often what we do as healthcare professionals is we go, oh my goodness, you've got a prolapse, nothing to worry about. And a woman goes away and goes, what the hell does this mean? Yeah. Looks online and it's terrifying. And then they end up going, you can't have sex with me because I've got a prolapse to their husband. Sex dwindles. The other thing is that I think is really vitally important is that we care for the skin and the muscles around the vagina and pelvic floor by giving women topical vaginal estrogen. Okay, that's great. Um, and Elle, would you like to tell us a little bit more about the ONAP? Because I'm quite sure that people are rather intrigued. And, and you know, there are there are lots of healthcare professionals that haven't yet discovered it. I think I was giving a I was giving, having a discussion with somebody just the other day, or it was I was at a I was um had an exhibition stand, a virtual exhibition stand at the College of Sex and Relationship Therapists, and I had the ONAT on the shelf behind me. And a couple of them said, Oh, what's that? I've never heard of it. So I had to get it out and show it to them. So I think it would be really helpful for you to tell them tell us a little bit about that and, and how you, you find both your healthcare professionals and people perhaps who are buying it directly from you. I think, you know, what was so lovely hearing Layla talk is that there are just, there are lots of different tools out there. There are lots of different healthcare professionals out there to help when you're in different stages of recovery. And there are also some really good products out there that can, that can help you, whether that be sort of prescription estrogens and things like that. And my, my sort of umbrella position that I sit in has always just been trying to find these tools to put in your I guess it's like a toolbox isn't it of things that can can help um 
you know, different women. And the owner is just this incredibly unique um, device. It was designed by somebody who had um, who experienced painful sex um, on penetration. And so it is a, they are just silicon, very soft rings that can stack together um, and they sit on the base of the penis um, or the penetrate, you know, if you're using dilators, they can sit on the base of the dilator and they can they create this really soft buffer, which just controls the depth of penetration. So if, you know, in the context of what we're talking about today, if you've, if your vagina has been shortened and you are then experiencing pain, this can just allow you to safely control penetration depth. So you can release the anxiety about will this become too deep? Will this pay, become painful? And that is a huge relief for the women, um, but also for partners as well to know that they're not going to be causing pain because that depth can be controlled. So it's just, it, it has been just a wonderful addition to, um, you know, the, the products available to women um, post-surgery. Um, and it and it's and once it's on, you don't really notice it's there. Um, so it can, you know, it's it it is a wonderful, um, really wonderful, very unique product that we've found helped a lot of women. And it's and and another product that it's just great for um, healthcare professionals to signpost, you know, signpost um, for for their patients. Um, and I think this this idea, um, you know, we haven't gone too much into this, but you know, once sex, once you experience pain with sex, there is then an anxiety. The body reacts to pain in a very protective way. So the pelvic floor, which are all those complex muscles in the base of the pelvis, will tighten up in a protective fashion. This can sort of exacerbate the problem. So even if the in, even if the in cases of say um, endometriosis, where a hysterectomy might solve the original cause of the pain, there can be a lot of resultant muscle tension that is caused by the anxiety because sex was painful, you know, pre-hysterectomy. So um, that's where women's health physios are really good to get involved in that stage. Um, possibly psychosexual therapists, you know, talking about these things and then looking to other devices like the ONUT that can help in that journey. So it is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm summarizing that quite quickly, but it is, it is quite complicated, um, but there are lots of things out there now, lots of healthcare professionals who can help if you meet the right one and um, lots of tools that you can use to actually help in, in those stages. And uh, uh, Leila, you mentioned about communication um, being hugely important and perhaps expectations before surgery to talk about what might happen afterwards with one's partner. Um, can, you can you tell us how, we can, how people can access um, a psychosexual therapy? I mean, I know that there is some provision under the NHS, but... Um, There's loads of provision under oh, the there NHS. There is. Oh, good. There's loads. Good. The problem we have is that we're kind of hidden. We're hidden in cupboards. Oh. Like literally, I was hidden in a cupboard in one trust, <laughs> basically because it wasn't commissioned. And I said, "Look, I'm training. I need to see." So I used to have to clear all the brooms out and then get my patients in, which was kind of okay when I had fit patients. I had someone turn up who was disabled, and it was a nightmare. Oh, uh, but anyway, but so now I'm in a proper established commission service in the NHS. Um, my wait is fairly long, but we're working on that at the moment. We've gone from a team of two. We're now a team of seven. Um, so we are we are working to get this to be a priority because it is a priority for our patients. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I've just done a, an audit on referrals to my clinic. Fifteen percent of patients in our gynae clinic have sexual pain, and that's just one area we're looking at. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot for women to talk about painful sex. I don't know if any of you've seen that um, study that was done by the British Menopause Society, where women's primary aim in seeing a menopause specialist is to talk about sexual difficulties and only a third of them spoke about it mm -hmm. that's because what we do as communicators is we we think I've got something really worrying to talk about I'm not sure what the reaction is going to be let me just fish a little bit and see what the reaction is going to be no this is not the right person 
which is why I feel very strongly that every single healthcare professional as part of their primary degree with ongoing education should be trained in talking to patients about sex because women and men feel that we are the people to talk to. <laughs> I would say well, there are some amazing, there are some wonderful um, healthcare professionals who make it the absolute necessity of every conversation. So, it, you know, I think it, it's great. Oh, I'm not saying it's not there. I yeah. think people do it despite the fact that perhaps they haven't had formal training. One analogy that I use a lot, L, with patients who've had painful sex, and it might be something as simple as thrush that started painful sex. It doesn't have to be major yeah. surgery. Is that it's like having your hand on a hot plate. You don't do it twice. And your body's reaction is this. Yeah. So please don't feel guilty that your vagina does this because it's mm. anticipating pain. Yes. And often we're not that great at managing the pain. We don't really have. So the other thing I've got in this audit is that we have multiple different ways of managing it because we don't train people how to manage it. Mm. So we can't expect people to kind of go, this is what I do if we've not got under guidance. So I'm hoping we're going to get that out there too. Um, but yeah, I work very closely with the women's health physios and actually the, um, the flow chart that I'm going to put together of how we should help patients and where they go is going to be, let's think about all the different fantastic healthcare professionals we've got who can help with different aspects. But I also think it's vitally important that physios feel comfortable being able to talk about sex. And I think the pelvic floor specialist physios are amazing at this. Mm. But they often do feel a bit trepidatious if someone discloses something. Yeah. So we should be giving basic training to you guys too, so you feel confident. Yeah. Fantastic. I think that's wonderful. Um, Leila, I think it would be really helpful if you could possibly uh, send me um, the details of a couple of the resources that you mentioned. So the 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 apps, Dipsy, and the name of the author of the of the erotic fiction. I didn't quite get those on the on Nancy screen. Friday. So I recommend Nancy Friday so much that when she died, the BBC contacted me for an, an obituary. Oh my goodness. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how they got hold of that. <laughs> um, but yeah, she was absolutely phenomenal. This woman who just said, I think it was in the 60s she started working. Women experience pleasure during sex. What do they fantasize about? And it was absolutely groundbreaking. People were horrified. This cannot be. And you'd be amazed at how many men who read her books who come back to me and go, I had no idea that women like sex. <laughs> OK, well, it would be got great. a long way to go. Yeah, you could share those resources with us and I'll make sure that I make them available to everybody. Um, I don't know. Is there anything else that we haven't covered that we should... We, you know, we're, we're very nearly to an hour, and I think that's about a limit of, of people's sort of... I mean, I think, I think what I would say is um, that we should also really think about menopause when we do hysterectomy. It is mandatory, in my opinion, to have at least that conversation. Um, the, the fallout from sudden surgical menopause for women, well, suicide rates in women are higher at any, in any age group of women between 45 and 55. And that's because of menopause. And mm -hmm. if you talk to Jane Lewis, uh, the author of My Menopausal Vagina, she will tell you that women are suicidal because of menopausal mm -hmm. vaginal symptoms. Mm -hmm. And I think if there's one take home thing today, it's that if you're not getting that care from your gynecologist, look at the British Menopause Society where we have accredited specialists on the register and get yourself referred. Yeah. Well, that's really helpful. Yeah. That's, yeah. And interesting that you said, even if you're if you're postmenopausal, when you have a hysterectomy, you can still have some recurrent symptoms, which you might not have been expecting because you would have thought, well, I'm already there. Your ovaries continue. So I'm I'm not a huge fan of taking ovaries out unless you've really obviously got pathology because they still produce androgens to give you sex drive. Yeah, your testosterone. I believe of course it's something like a quarter of your testosterone is produced in your ovaries and of course lots of women don't even realize lots lots of people don't realize that actually we have testosterone <laughs> they think it's the male hormone don't they yeah absolutely brilliant okay so the take-home message is think about menopause and make sure that you find um you get some help with the, with those symptoms yeah um i think that's wonderful Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Elle, for oh, thank you. Us. And thank you, Leila. It's wonderful, wonderful to see you. And I know that people, um, we, we had 33 people registered altogether, but we will be making sure that this is available to people afterwards.
Fantastic. And it's so great to meet you, Elle. I oh, see, a, I see a lot of Lavinia because I've kind of been going this own up thing, but I had no face to put to it. Oh, so, I could be your face now. And you... well, and I, I think it would be really useful if you came and spoke to the Institute of Psychotechnical Medicine at some point. Yeah, Vinia I'd love quite to often comes Because I think this is the kind of thing that I sometimes fall across by chance. Yeah. Um, I see it quite often. Um, on social media, I see something new and I go, right, I'm gonna go and have a look at that. Yeah. And I stalk sex toy pages, just yeah. to keep an eye out. Goodness knows what my trust thinks of my search engine. <laughs> um, because I think we we have a duty of care to look at what's out there. It's yeah, like, I, I'd love to do that. And I and I think it's, you know, and it's, it's just, for, for, for me, it's just really that message for women that there are healthcare professionals out there to help you who understand there are diff lots of different tools, lots of different products, and it's just find, you know, it's finding them, it's finding the right people and it's finding the right things. Um, and, and to think that women are lost or haven't got the right advice or support, that is what, you know, keeps, you know, certainly drives me because there are things out there and there are people out there to help. So it's just trying to put it put it all together um, I mean, for me. I see patient support groups, uh, representatives talking, saying the only people are available in the States. Yeah. I'm saving up to go to the States. Yeah. And we have just this amazing number of pelvic floor physios. Yes. We have this amazing number of members of the IPM. Yeah. We have about 700 people on our books and we're all yeah. over the country who are either training yeah. or trained who are prepared to come out and give talks to trusts, yes. to educational establishments, but we really just need to be quite vocal because I yeah. feel very strongly that my patients don't have a voice. And you're, entitled to, you're entitled to this support from the NHS. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that it's, it's available, you know, you don't have to go privately. It is available to you in the NHS. And I think that's really important. So I can see people in the NHS if they've got a North East South West postcode in London mm. at the moment. You can get referred to my clinic. Brilliant. Okay. Fabulous. Well, thank, thank you, Lavinia, you. for hosting. Well, thank you very much. That's really, really wonderful. Um, we'll make sure that this is available to other people and it'll stay out there on YouTube so that everybody can benefit. We've had some lovely messages from people yeah. this and saying that they're, they think they've got the confidence to start again. And one said, my husband had better watch out. <laughs> <laughs> That's Excellent. a great note to end on. I do sometimes get the husband coming to see me going, my wife's great now, but I'm really struggling a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> <Really happy. laughs> oh, okay, well, goodbye, everybody. And thank you uh, for all those that watch. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Oh, we'll, be doing some more, we'll be doing some more webinars on different topics, but all around women's health, because that's what we're passionate about. Delighted to see that Cheryl's just posted she's doing some sex and cancer work with Macmillan. That's brilliant. brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye, Thanks. Bye. Bye.